Hi, I'm Riley Fidechko, and today I'm going to tell you why Carnot engines are the most efficient. So rather than starting with Carnot engines themselves, I'm going to start with heat engines in general and explain to you what we want when we have a heat engine. So in general, heat engines operate so that heat, or Q, that comes in is going to either be transformed into work or a change in thermal energy or temperature. Okay? This can be written as an equation where Q equals work plus delta E therm. Now, with a heat engine, one of our goals is to get the most possible useful work out. So keeping in mind that work here is the goal, you should really start thinking about isothermal processes. In isothermal processes, there is no delta E therm. So we can effectively ignore this branch down here. And if heat is flowing into the system, all of that heat will be converted into useful work. Now, doesn't this violate the process uh, or the Carnot efficiency and uh, the fact that we can't get 100% useful work out from a thermal gradient? Well, it's a little misleading because you have to remember this would be one isothermal expansion. This is only one process. It does not constitute a cycle. If we want a cycle, in other words, if we want to be able to get energy out of this a second time, we need some way to return to the original state. So for returning to the original state, for sort of the same but reverse reasoning, an isotherm is also ideal. So we know that the most efficient heat engine will involve two isotherms. So I have here a PV diagram with two possible isotherms, T hot and T cold. Now, even though we have these two isotherms, we might say travel along this one in an expansion and travel along this one in a compression, but we still don't have an actual cycle. We need to find some way to cross this thermal gradient and get the system from the hot temperature to the cold temperature and vice versa. Now I propose that the best way to do this, the most efficient way, is with an adiabat. Now adiabatic processes, as you'll remember, have no heat exchange with the surroundings. What this means is that all change in thermal energy is contained within the system. All change in temperature is contained within the system and is therefore very efficient. So I'll draw a couple adiabats on here for you so you can see. And now with these on here we finally have a cycle, a possible heat engine. Now another way to examine if this is efficient or not is to look at it graphically. Remembering that the area within the cycle is the network done per cycle you want to maximize the area within the cycle as long as you're operating between the same two temperatures. Now if any other process other than an adiabat, say an isochoric process, like so, you'd be losing out on all of this so-called cycle area. And you can see graphically that it's less efficient. Now using this graphical approach you might be tempted to say well hey wouldn't it be even better yet to have a square like this because that cycle does enclose more area so you would get more useful work out of it. This however is a little misleading because you're actually operating between two different temperatures. TH is now here and TC is now here. So you can't really compare these two cycles because it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges and indeed if we're operating between this larger thermal gradient out here, I could once again use adiabatic processes to include even more cycle area, which I am shading in right now. So what I'm hoping you're seeing is that the most efficient heat engine cycle is going to involve two isotherms and two adiabats. And as it turns out, that is precisely what a Carnot engine cycle is. So this is why a Carnot engine is the most efficient. And also because Jason said so. Thank you.